presently the biggest risk on the, on the Kenyan market, Kenjan, mm. I think with premiums of uh, 1.2 billion shillings mm. was floated. The rates came to 30% what they were last year. Yeah, so the, if the industry premium for Kenjan was 1.2 billion in the previous year, now it's come to 900 million. And, and people have taken it, insurance companies have taken it. We were invited to look, we looked at it, we said uh, we can't play at that level because the claims are going to surely come. And then accompanied with that, you have, that's at a gross level. So you haven't even taken out commissions yes. and other expenses that you must pay, uh, you know, the brokers and so on. So at a gross level, the premiums are not right for the risk that you're underwriting. And you just have to be strong enough to say, sorry, we can't take that. Now, if the whole industry actually took such a position, Kenjan would still have to have an insurer. And they'll go back and say, we can't place this business at this level. And therefore, we are going to... Uh, increase the premiums according to what the market is rating it at. Uh, the second example is the collection, which was also a very key uh, driver uh, or a key determinant that uh, risk-based capital was, was trying to fix. And uh, so we go out and write premiums, we show good top line, but the money is out there so with, the, the with the broker or with the client. Mm -hmm. And the risk comes, you know, the year comes and goes. You haven't been paid, you write off. So again, you showed very good growth. But all of that has gone into provisioning and bad debt write-off. Uh, again, not very good for, for the industry, not good for shareholders or anyone. So we have also said, you know, we are going to be very stringent. Yes, we are going to provide debt uh, uh, or credit for that matter because it is what the market has come to expect, but within a certain control. And none of the companies uh, has done very well in this area. They will give you credit because you was, but for 30 days. After that, it's an automatic cancellation. No questions asked. And they're making progress. So again, uh, such a company is probably going to suffer, uh, quote unquote, in the short term. But in the long term, they are going to have solid respect from the market, solid capability to provide uh, service because the customer is going to know. If I go with this company, it's going, I'm going to pay, I'm going to meet my end of bargain and they're likely to also meet their end of the bargain, which is, I think, what the, the confidence that needs to be brought back to the market, that we need to be tough, but also to be fair. Mm -hmm. And we need to say, this is the space in which we will operate. Because I think when we define that space and the customers begin to see you live up to those ideals and aspirations, mm -hmm. I think they, you restore the confidence that, that this industry so much needs. Mm -hmm. I, I'll name that company, but I think they are, they are giving us courage that, mm -hmm. I mean, you can take tough, considerate decisions mm -hmm. uh, on the acquisition side, but also do the same on the service on the service side. So I think if we don't fix it as the CEOs who are sitting in this space in this time, um, I think it becomes even more difficult for future generations to fix this problem. It, I mean, I know you don't want to hear that it is pricing, but it is pricing more than anything else. And I, I want to talk about things that we can control. Yes. Okay, fraud we can control, but only to a certain extent, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. And you can, there's a sense in which you can also price for that fraud to a certain extent. So yes. if we have systems and technology that we are using, I think we make it difficult for the, claim, uh, for the fraudulent uh, person to, to get uh, compensated. But we may not be able to eliminate, but we can actually show some, some progress in that level. But I, I say pricing is the main thing because you have the experience of how a scheme performed, not just last year and the year before, but the previous years. You have the population, you have data. I think in every three years, if you make a loss in one year, you could be excused because you are taking your chances, you are managing the risk. But when you, when you actually make a, a, a loss, consistently, that means something is not right. Either you're not responding to what feedback you're getting, uh, and this is a loss ratio that we, we see. We see the populations, we see how they have, the benefits have been used. We should be sensitive to what the hospitals are doing. Uh, and the, uh, we, we've seen the you know, hospitals are increasing costs. Uh, the cost of medication is increasing from yeah, pharmacies. Every three months. Every, every three months or yeah. every so often. So if I'm a sensible underwriter. Why should I not be able to take into account those realities today? Uh, I may not, it, may, it may not be um, something I can do for the current book, but it should be able to inform me 
as I come to do the renewal process. But what we do, we, we look at that and we say, you know, next year things are going to change for the better. So we actually even reduce the price so that I can just have the business. So it is, price is at our control, we can control that. So if we don't address that as the biggest factor, I'm not saying it's the only factor that uh, leads a book into a loss, but I think it's the one that is within our immediate ambit. It's our low-lying fruit and we are not picking it. I think um, the companies that would have probably sold out because of the difficulties of compliance have just been given a bin to continue surviving and to continue doing business in that manner. Uh, I'm sorry to, to say, but I think we are yet to see a regulator come in strongly to regulate uh, this industry. So we, we, risk-based capital was, was a good idea. Uh, I think I may not, I, I did not agree with everything that was in the detail. But I think those are details and we could, we, could, we could sort them out. But it was actually one of the most, um, can I say, one of the most forward-moving, futuristic things that this industry needed to, to do. Because it would force us to ensure that every day we are doing something that is in, within a certain uh, framework. Now that framework has been pushed out and I think the message it is sending to the industry is that it really, it really never stood a chance of time. And the same effort it has taken us to, from 2015, to build up to where we were now, where we looked at 1.2 times capital, 1.5 times capital, 1.8 times capital, which would have been the effective uh, situation, is actually been a joke then. It's been pushed away. The same effort, it's gonna, it's gonna take the same effort to get that level of discipline back into the industry. So I don't think we will be in, in for any easier time. Now, companies that were saying, hey, we, uh, our capital is almost wiped out. We are not able to go back to the shareholders and inject more capital into the business. Or where our management is, we cannot actually swing this to ensure that we are at two times capital, 1.8 times capital. Um, those companies are going to go back and do business as usual, and therefore, where they were looking out for help, they're not going to look out for that help. They're going to be happy to continue holding on to what they call an insurance company in return, not for core business returns, but for investment income. And regardless of whether those are you know, reducing by year by year because with the capping of the interest rates with the bank, there's been a, a, there's a, been a maximum as to what we can make. They are not, we are not going to make the super returns that we saw we saw in the prior year, out of uh, fixed deposits or out of treasury bills, those are, you know, in a sense, capped at about 12% or thereabouts. You know, the capital, the stock exchange is also not uh, been vibrant. So again, uh, people are gonna, owners are gonna have to ask what they are, they are in this space for, uh, especially if we don't fix the core business. There's a, there's a consequential in, in, impact on, on investment income and they just might end up saying it's not worth it. So I think those sensible ones from that point of view either go back and fix their business or look for a worthy partner to, to try and do a, a man, an amalgamation or a, a, a consolidation with. So it does open up opportunities, but I think it also makes it difficult, uh, easy for companies to continue operating as business as usual, no change. I think I would say yes, um, but not the only one. Uh, not the, definitely there are many other things to, to fix. Uh, and customer education is one of them. And for the customer to get education, we must do something, they must do something, we must meet at some point. The law has been, uh, you know, uh, the IRA has pushed in treating customers fairly and made it as one of the things that would be coming to inspect. As an industry, as a, as a company, we looked at it, we put in place the six pillars of um, customer service, whether it's at acquisition service, uh, before sales information, after sales information, disclosures, how you treat a customer at the claim stage and all that. Uh, but that is likely to just remain very good principles and concepts uh, because they'll tell you what, how you interact with the customer. But I think in this uh, old age war, that the, customer, that the insurance industry doesn't know what the customer wants. I think it's a little broader than that. I think what the customer is basically asking for is, um, can you make it easy for me to access these products? Um, 
like, let's take the banking because we always compare to banks. These days, very few people will go to the banking homes because they can do everything on their phone uh, against the back of telcos. So part of it is we should be asking ourselves, how am I going to be relevant to the customer? How can I use the phone to actually reach the customer more and more and allow them to actually get in and look at their policies or make payments, make changes, and so on. But I think we always forget. So while that is very good, I think we always forget that the principle of utmost good faith can be questioned in today's world. In the olden days, if somebody said, I had an accident, they actually did have that accident. And you took, you took their word for that. For, we, we actually said, you know, banked on that utmost good faith, that what you're telling me is true, and there is a premium. So um, look at it in the banking process. If I say I'm moving my money out, the bank has already ring fence. I can only move my money out to a certain expect, or the MPESA payments. So, that gives them room for them to be, to be innovative, to move fast, to be relevant to the customer, to ask as few questions as possible. But for us, I think, because the utmost good faith concept may not always work and may actually, end you, may actually ensure that you end up in, in a hot soup because of fraud, we will ask questions that then impede the growth, impede the innovation, impede a whole lot of things. So that's the first thing that Maybe the concept of insurance is very different from the concept of banking in as far as customer engagements and, uh, and um, innovation is concerned. Then we go back and say, how much of the laws do we, that we follow, how, much, how, how often, do, uh, how free are they for us to do, to engage in, um, in innovation? Let me, let's take the Traffic Act, uh, which says you have to have a disk in your, on, on your windscreen of vehicle, your vehicle has proof that the vehicle should be on the road. That has stayed that way. We've tried to change that, that because it's paper-based. We even said, put, a, put a, some automated something there that I can push data into. And the policeman will still be able to see that you've got a valid insurance license or not. That, way would, that would allow, would cut off the need for you to come to us or to visit the branches because we now can have an electronic platform to uh, to uh, to uh, talk with you, but so unless some of the rules change, insurance is likely to still be seen to be as archaic as the laws themselves. Uh, have we have we lobbied the government as an industry to change some of these things to allow us to be a little more innovative? Yes. Do we still have a long way to go? Yes. Have we talked to telcos and found out how we could do things differently? It's also yes. Um, and go, let me go back to the utmost good faith. There's nothing to stop me from going home to photograph and say, okay, I got a new fridge today. I'm going to photograph it, attach it to this. I'm going to, I bought a new music system today. I'm going to photograph it and attach it. I think all that can happen and attach that to an application form and send it to the insurance company. And I think some people are doing it. But then utmost good faith still need to be tested that if you say you bought, you actually bought this today, it's not your neighbors that you photographed and you're sending me. We are likely to still have to ask questions at the point of loss. Uh, give us a receipt from uh, Nakumat or whatever that you bought this and so on. So this become very, very, they become, they slow down. It's not as, it's not as if I want to move my money and pay it to 10 people and all that. There's no recourse to the bank. But for us, you, uh, you are saying here is uh, 2,000 bob for a fridge worth 50,000 bob. Uh, th that equation is very, very, you get what I mean? Because yeah. I could actually, we could open up and do that, but then we will also be the first ones to close if you don't exercise due care. And that's why the customer, comparing to other faster moving services, we are seen to be very, very backward. And we are seen not to understand what the customer uh, want because of the questions you ask.